네, 벌써 마지막 세션 시간입니다. Oh, thank you. This is the last session of the day. Uh, this session will be dealing with the topic academic evolution and future development of overseas Korean studies. So it will be a general uh, discussion session, and I think that we're going to have some very energetic and active discussions. Uh, the moderator for this session is uh, Professor Park Taegyun of Seoul National University. His main concern is the history of international relations between the Korean Peninsula and great powers in modern world history. And he published several books uh, on Korean, the Korean War, Vietnam War, and the U.S. military government in South Korea. And uh, Professor, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor to moderate the last session. It was exactly 11 years back where when we were holding the 20th anniversary uh, Korean Studies Forum, I was the moderator of the last session as well. And I remember I have a vivid memory of that moment and it was in this very room. And I don't know if I can call this fortunate or not, but you can see that we have a completely different panel uh, than 11 years back, which indicates the evolution of Korean studies. Well, that's my personal take. And we don't have a lot of uh, time remaining, so we'll have to swiftly engage in the general discussions. And I will not introduce you to the speakers in detail. As you know, uh, they have been already introduced in other sessions. And also to save time, uh, I would like to skip the introductions and, and to offer more opportunities uh, for our panelists. And I would like to conduct a session as to have the panelists make two comments each as we move on. And we do have uh, common questions for all of our six panelists. Yeah, you can see that our discussants are from different organizations and from different countries. And my question would be, in your respective countries, what kind of changes uh, are you witnessing in Korean cities and any changes in the demand uh, for Korean studies? So I would like to ask uh, you to speak within three minutes. So you have three minutes each on any changes that you witness in Korean studies. And then uh, I would like to move on to the next uh, question. So just briefly, in three minutes, please. Uh, first, Professor Kim. So you were just saying, yeah, yeah. just talking about change. And I was in the session just now about Korean language. 한국어에 관한 uh, session 있었는데요. What the moderator said was also the same thing. The change, the sea change that has happened compared to 10 years ago. And what she meant by that was the main language that was spoken 10 years ago was English. And today, majority of the speakers spoke Korean. And it didn't come across as strange at all. So that was one thing that, and I want to start with that because within Korean studies, the part that has been banging in my head all day today was about the relationship between Korean language and Korean studies. How can we go together? And the kind of a relationship that has existed in, the, at least in the US, the language studies and Korean studies as content studies, so-called, has been quite different. And so something, again, it's not quite related what you asked, but there was something in my head and I wanted to uh, uh, talk about that briefly. At the same time, we talked a lot about the rapid increase of everything, anything related to K-pop. And Within that also, and I want to point out one thing, that the research that has been concentrating on K-pop and film studies, new media studies, everything to do with that 
we have had in the U.S. at least, the publication has been overwhelming numbers of publications have been coming out. And I want to pause here and for us to think about the quality of the publication. And the, a lot of the publishing companies, they are going for, of course, making books to sell. Even the university publishers, because university publication, publishers have been very worried about not being able to publish any um, kind of books that have not been selling, but those that have been selling are the ones related to those areas. So at the same time, because of that, how easy, I'm not saying how easy at this point, and, and don't take me wrong here, but the part, something we need to really seriously think about is how do we manage the quality of publication that has been really bringing sea change in the U.S. at least that is related to Korean pop culture. 네, 감사합니다. 바바라 발 교수님 부탁드립니다. Um, Thanks, uh, Professor Barbara Barr. Part in this, um, I would like to emphasize three aspects um, that I think are important for the change in Korean studies. And I would like to emphasize also that I'm speaking out of my little uh, Korean studies bubble in Denmark. So what might be relevant for me might not be relevant for you. Um, so the three aspects I would like to emphasize is um, something we already discussed before, language ability, the second one is cooperation between disciplines in Korean studies. And the third point, I think what is, I think Jisoo has mentioned it before uh, at the beginning of today, uh, digital methods and digital humanities. Um, I have, ah, okay. So um, when I, uh, John Duncan um, emphasized in the morning how important Korean language is, um, I can also uh, uh, only support this. Um, and as um, um, Ian Jung said, um, in, in Europe, it's quite Korean studies, kind of the basis for Korean studies in Europe is Korean language training. And I think this is something that shouldn't change. I can see that at some universities to make it easier or to get more students, it's possible to do or to learn about Korea without doing any Korean language training. But this is not to be inclusive, it's more to save money. And I think we have to be uh, careful that we, we go against this trend. Um, I think for Europe, it's also important to mention um, that I think, and that's also, I'm part of the problem, um, that people who are teaching in Korean studies in a country like Denmark, for example, have to uh, need the language abilities of that country. So what we can see quite often in Europe that people are hired also, I mean, including myself in Denmark, who don't speak Danish at the beginning. Or also in Germany, people who speak Korean and English, but don't speak, or only Korean, but don't speak German. And I think that's the best way to marginalize and weaken Korean studies, because then scholars in Korean studies will never be part of big decision making, because they don't speak the language of the country they are in. Just, I think that's not a problem in, in North America, right? Then um, the second point, cooperation. Um, I really like the idea uh, that Jisoo mentioned that we have to be more inclusive. Um, also Clark Sörensen, uh, he, he, he made very clear that it doesn't really make sense to differentiate so much anymore between uh, the Korean diaspora and Korea because there is so much exchange going back and forth. This is also a case in in, in Scandinavia with a huge community of um, Korean adoptees um, and you can feel the tension and I think it would be a great idea to, to be more inclusive. And um, then um, Professor Korbanov, you mentioned also that you would like to include more kukak, hakja, right? And um, now it's a bit promotion time. <laughs> um, Professor Yin Jung, she mentioned that the AXE, the, the Association for Korean Studies in Europe, um, and the, the next conference will be next year in June from 22 to 25 in Copenhagen. And I think that is actually a good place to exchange ideas 
because at this unit, at uh, the AXA conference, you can also present in Korean and in English. So I think this is, would be a good opportunity to bring scholars from uh, Global Korean Studies and KUKAK together. So if you search um, for the homepage for the Association for Korean Studies in Europe, uh, on the blackboard, you can see the call for papers. You still have one month to um, submit your abstracts. So please all submit your abstracts. Um, and then the last point, because I'm running out of time, I think, um, and we talked about this also during lunch, um, many of you will feel this pressure of you are supposed to use digital methods and so on. And I think this is something we should perhaps discuss a little bit more. Um, I'm more the critical voice. I, I did a, a workshop on digital Korean studies and I was more the one who's saying, so what does, do we actually benefit from this? But I think it's time to think more about um, how, what we, how we can benefit from digital methods in Korean studies. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. You talked about Kukka, uh, and uh, we are seeing some meaningful changes in Korea. In the Korean National University uh, Department has actually changed their department to combine the departments into Korean History Department. So I can see that uh, maybe the term Kukka will be obsolete soon enough. Let's uh, moving on to Professor Nishino. So I have already gone over the progress of Korean studies in Japan during my talk. But just to summarize again, from my perspective, as I have mentioned earlier, um, the Japanese uh, scholars are at the risk of losing their competitive edge because there were some close proximity in terms of relations and similarities that the two countries shared in terms of culture and values and language. But now that K-pop is sweeping across the world and Korean studies has become truly global, uh, Japanese scholars, uh, since they do not, they are not very proficient in English and their uh, publications are uh, increasingly perceived to be less reliable. And I came to think that Korean studies in other nations, well, in some countries are still in their initial stage. So if they are able to plan out a good program, they have great potential for growth. But in the case of Japan, we have a tradition, and it is not easy to change that, particularly for universities, because we already have a very fully established departments and disciplines. So to adopt a new side of Korean studies, such as Hallyu, which is also popular in Japan, that is not easy to accommodate such a change and to develop and open a new uh, Korean program. Because there is the Chosun Studies, which has a very long history and deep-rooted history in Japan. And one more thing, since I am a political scientist, Korean studies in Japan, looking back uh, to the 1950s, the Joseon studies that really focused on the Korean language, um, and then there was the Joseon History Research Association that looked into the history of Korea. So the Korean language and history have a very long and deep-rooted history, but for social sciences, um, contemporary Korean society of uh, Korean Society of Korean Social Studies was only established in the 2000s. So as an area of study, Korean studies first began, but how do we expand that into social sciences or political sciences and different disciplines? and try to look at Korean studies from these all these different perspectives to present Korean studies as an attractive um, area of study to our students and to um, provoke the interest among other scholars. I think that is the key focus for Japanese scholars of Korean studies. Thank you very much. Sup Professor Supapun. Hello, everyone. I'm from Thailand. 
And if I may tell you the Korean study situation in Thailand, um, if you look at Southeast Asia, we have a long history in Thai studies, but if you look at um, uh, well, Korean studies, history of Korean studies is quite long, but a master's course only uh, exists in uh, our Chula Longkorn University. So we don't have that many degree programs. So most of the students would graduate, graduate study abroad, or in Thailand, uh, they will get employed. Uh, but if I may also talk about the research situation in Korean studies in Thailand, I believe that in terms of the number of papers, uh, PH, uh, PhD papers account for 8.8% and master's degree papers account for 51.6% and the dissertations in these journals account for about 40% that, that are presented in seminars. So you can see that uh, we do have scholars that do engage in research and there's a lot of research on Korean education but most of that have to do with contrast, comparative analysis, uh, grammar, vocabulary, uh, pronunciation, and research on Korean studies uh, are mostly uh, for seminar presentations or for publishing sake. But if you look at the contents of Korean studies have to do with Hallyu, pop culture, economy, and in Thailand, uh, there are some popular celebrities, so the research is focused on uh, these topics. But compared to the past, I think that uh, Thailand probably focused a lot of its research on politics and economy if you look at this as a whole throughout the history. So I'm seeing that there's a shift in the areas that are being studied and also in terms of education. Uh, not all, only a comparative or contrast analysis uh, on grammar or vocabulary, I can see that it's moving on to uh, expand the scope and there is a lot of study that's done on Korean culture. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Recently, I think it was three years back, where I saw an interesting paper by a Thai student on Webtoon. It was on the Gangnam Mi in Webtoon, and I thought that Webtoons can play a critical role uh, in the process. Yes, that is correct, because even now in Thailand, uh, Hallyu uh, media contents and particularly webtoons are very popular. Uh, one of my students uh, is currently studying webtoon of Korea. Yes, moving on, Professor Malankai. English. Uh, so, um, I, I guess I don't really have any uh, kind of grand insight to share. I just see some problems um, across Australia, at least. Uh, and, and the first one is uh, that different departments around Australia and New Zealand uh, have different workloads. And we're, we're all kind of serving as ambassadors in a sense of Korean studies and of Korea quite often trying to defend what we do. And some people as a result of that have um, substantial workloads on top of their teaching and their research and so on. So that's that's one issue. The other is metrics. So I completely agree uh, with Professor Kim about you know the importance of good quality uh, publications. It was earlier mentioned too that we need to make sure that we publish also in other languages outside of uh, English. But then some universities will put pressure on their staff to publish there where the metrics are uh, not hit and miss, but uh, you know, quick and, and uh, certainly recognizable. So please do not publish in Chinese, for example, because it doesn't show up on Google Scholar. So, and then I guess uh, a third issue that I see that isn't really related to um, the, uh, I guess, the, the work that we do as academics, but certainly um, affects, uh, I think, 
most of us, as, as has become clear today, is what to do with all these wonderful students who are excited about K-pop. Because as we all have recognized, it doesn't necessarily lead to more uh, PhD uh, students. And, and one thing that bothers me about that is that I, certainly I don't have any answers, but that what we're dealing with then is, is not just the individual, but we're also dealing with parents and, and the view they have of career. Um, we're, we're talking about quite often uh, students who are at the age of 13, 14, completely smitten with Korean culture. Um, and that is sponsored in a sense by their parents. Um, so how do we then engage with both the parents and these young, excited students uh, b even before they come to uh, uh, our universities. I, I don't have an answer, but I, I just see that as a challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. And joining us online, we have Professor Lin hyung Gu. Please take the floor. Okay, thank you, Professor Park. So before starting my comments, uh, I'd like to first thank Professor Park and the Korea Foundation for inviting me to contribute to this round table. And also please allow me to seize this opportunity to express my congratulations and gratitude to the Korea Foundation for over 40 years of providing essential leadership and support for the growth of Korean studies overseas through its various programs and initiatives. And second, my apologies for not being able to join in person as I had originally planned uh, despite having a second booster shot, uh, Corona, I think, has powers of evasive growth that escaped the discernment of most medical specialists. So I'm afraid I'm still recovering from COVID. So on to the question itself. Uh, so Professor Puck asked us to briefly outline changes or growth in Korean studies in our area of location. So I happen to be in Canada, so I can provide two brief points. One is a very simple story of growth that I would suspect mirrors the stories and the accounts that we've heard already. Uh, and this involves growth in numbers of students and probably faculty in different departments. And of course, the growth in students can be attributed in part to two factors. One is the increase in popularity of the Korean wave. So Korea, yes, of course, K-pop, but also TV shows and films, as well as video games. And the second is simply a larger number of people interested in Korea with, I think, the requisite language capacities receiving their PhDs in social sciences departments in North America. So this has resulted in a steady story of growth, especially in the two major urban centers of Vancouver and Toronto. Now, the second major point I would flag here is that the actual growth in research on Korea-Canada relations or possibly subjects that affect both countries is not one of, un, I suppose, limited growth, but one of very limited increases in diversity. So if we think back, let's say 30, 40 years ago, um, much research on Korea-Canada interactions would have focused on probably the Korean War or on the history of Canadian missionaries in Korea. These, I think, subjects remain essential to further research, but the reality is that growth in in-depth, precise research on other areas of Canada-Korea interactions, such as perhaps the nuclear power plant deal in the 1970s or ice hockey cultural exchanges between Canada and North Korea, among many other possible subjects, remains rather limited in scale and scope of publication. So I would simply, again, point to two trends, one of growth in popularity of Korean studies as an educational forum, and the second one of very limited increases in diversity at the level of academic research. Thank you. Uh, yes, so in the 70s, you've also talked about uh, the nuclear power plant exchange, so that's quite interesting. But 
let me take a different um, approach. The reason why we decided to uh, invite Professor Lin hyung gu was because if we look at Korean studies and area studies, uh, maybe you can compare the two because Professor Lin uh, is an editor-in-chief uh, in Pacific Affairs. So there, it's not only about Korean studies, but there are also many dissertations published in this journal. So as a editor-in-chief of Pacific Affairs, I wanted to ask, uh, whether there are any different trends in Korean studies versus the trends in area studies. What kind of differences or traits exist if we refer to the trends of the past four or five years, four to five years? So, Dr. Lin? Okay, thank you. So, I should just explain further that Pacific Affairs has been published continuously since 1928, and it has been part of what's called the Social Science Citation Index or Journal Citation Reports. So you might think the Premier League, if it's football, of academic journals uh, since the inception of these indexing programs. So the journal covers all social sciences di disciplines, but does not cover humanities. So we don't do, uh, let's say, even modern history or literature, but we do cover all the social sciences disciplines. In general, we publish about 20 articles per year and receive about 20 submissions per year and publish one article per year on Korea-related subjects. It can be on North Korea, South Korea, North Korean refugees in South Korea, China-South Korea relations. We publish one out of every 20 submissions. So there is clearly an issue with the quality as several people in the same panel mentioned. So to return to the question, so how does Korean studies, at least from my perspective, diverge or converge with other area studies fields. So I'd like to very quickly uh, go over five areas in a compact time frame. So the first would be research subjects, the second research design or analysis, and third research methods, and fourth reviewing or professional production of academic output, and fifth, the actual venues for communications or publications. So first for research subjects, to put it simply, uh, Korean studies has on the one hand been convergent with other fields such as Chinese studies or Southeast Asia studies, however these are defined, uh, in the growth in diversity of subjects and the increase in number of submissions. At the same time, Korean studies, I think, does still diverge from Chinese studies in that the number of subjects that most scholars cover tends to be relatively concentrated around two classic areas, which is democracy, whether as growth consolidation or decline or deconsolidation, or economic policies, usually state intervention, state policies. So, for example, uh, South Korea is the leader among OECD countries in areas such as elderly welfare poverty or suicide rates, especially among young women, but these subjects are relatively understudied. Uh, for example, if you look at Chinese studies, you will see works on internet censorship, alternative energy, simply a broader range of subjects. So I think Korean studies in the future can work on diversifying its coverage while, of course, keeping an eye on the quality of logic and empirical research. The one area that has been a divergent increase in Korean studies compared to Chinese or Japanese studies is quite predictably in Korea wave related subjects. So within media studies or communication studies, I think we see a lot more active publication uh, agendas and outputs. So turning to the second area of research design or analysis, Korean studies, I would say, it faces common challenges. It is conversion with all other area studies. In the basic essential issues like defining the research question or puzzles, or if you prefer dependent variables or explanatum, that is what is being explained as distinguished from factors that do the explaining, explanans or independent variables, remains a constant, persistent challenge for all scholars, regardless of the social science discipline or geographic area of specialization. 
So this may be simply an example of human limits to analysis, but I think this is an area of quality of analysis and logical consistency that we can all try to improve on. Third, for research methods, I will briefly simply flag the point that Korean studies is somewhat divergent from other areas such as Southeast Asia or Pacific Island studies in the relative paucity of use of team approaches to research. So what in anthropology might be called patchwork ethnography. So I think in the future, if there are infrastructural organizational uh, assistances for developing team approaches to common problem or puzzle. I think this could help make use of the fact that travel might be more limited under the new COVID order uh, and that we have technologies now to facilitate digital or virtual cooperation and collaboration. Fourth, uh, reviewing. Okay, so this is a common problem for Korean studies and all other disciplines and area studies. Most people do not receive any form of training in how to review a book manuscript or an article in any of these disciplines or fields resulting in, I think, a systemic failure. Korean studies suffers in part from relatively smaller numbers than something like Chinese studies or Japanese studies, which means that finding arm's length and capable and competent timely reviewers is a challenge to begin with. But because of the lack of training in how to help facilitate either this publication or decline or rejection, what happens is that there's quite a bit of time wasted on trying to find competent and willing reviewers. And then how, I guess, the challenges of dealing with, I would say, insufficient reviews. So what do editors do with reviews that have no substance? So this is common for Korean studies and all other areas. Fifth and last for this question, in terms of scholarly outputs, I think uh, Korean studies currently has many journals that have Korea in the title. So we can think of the Seoul Journal of Korean Studies, Korea Observer, among many others. I think what we probably need to do is focus on how to streamline review protocols and increase quality. Because if you think of something like Chinese studies, China Quarterly is usually one of the top five journals in all of the area studies for impact factor. Now, this is actually a reflection of sheer scale, not necessarily quality of output. But I think what we can do is look hard at the benefits of having different journals, what the specialization differentiations might be between these, and think about ways we can all help each other to improve quality and review protocols. So there, for example, there's a social science journal of Japan, Japanese journal of political science, so on and so forth. And there are loose parallels to Korean studies as well. But I think it may be time to think about what the particular strength and possible weaknesses of each journal might be that are focused on Korea. And then think about ways in which they, the Korea focused journals might be better integrated into the larger bibliometric system that does tend for better or worse to govern publications in social sciences. Okay, thank you. 예, 감사합니다. 좀 많이 이렇게 가슴을 좀 찌르는 얘긴데 사실 제가 그 해외에 Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I had to cringe uh, when, you know, based on your criticism. So, uh, yes, actually, the reason why I did not cut uh, him off is because he, he talked about some critical elements, some realistic elements. And I thought that uh, the Pacific Affairs is focused on the Pacific region, but uh, I believe that uh, Professor Barbara Wall, if you think about the trend in Chinese or Japanese studies and Korean studies, what differences were you able to see in Copenhagen? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult to generalize uh, Europe. Um, I can only, I mean, um, uh, Professor Jin showed statistics from uh, uh, for Copenhagen that I shared because um, we can see now that um, this year, I saw that the numbers who apply of students who applied for China studies are lower than the number of students who applied for Japan or Korea studies. In the case of um, of Copenhagen, uh, it's still that Japan studies um, they have a little more 
more students than, than career studies, but <laughs> I think one problem is also, and I think this is something perhaps that's also common for other universities, is that um, the, the fundament, although, uh, for example, China studies has less students, there are already professors there. So there are six professors, but there are less students. Um, and you don't fire these professors. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so it's uh, so. But now we are lucky. We have uh, Jin Sang Pil also in in Copenhagen. So we have two professors who can take care of the of students. But still, compared to the numbers of professors, we have much more to do. <laughs> and this will not change because you cannot just fire uh, professors in a different area just because they have less students suddenly. And I think this is kind of a problem. And this is also why I emphasize that it's so Im important to know the language of the country you are in. Because St. Pil and me, we, don't, we are not Danish. I mean, I try my best to learn Danish, but um, to be included in uh, important decisions, you need to know the language of the country, mm. right? Also to strengthen Korean studies. Professor Malianchai, what about you? What about in Australia? What's the situation there? Uh, it's, um, it's surprising to me to see that in um, Australia, at least, uh, Chinese programs are uh, kind of devoid of culture. So the general, as I, as I also uh, showed in my presentation earlier today, the general kind of approach to China is a security one. It's um, the, the majority of students are interested in how to deal with the threat of China. And uh, there are very few kind of cultural events, um, although they do take place, but uh, cultural events that really attract big numbers. So uh, it's an unfortunate situation because um, we've had this with Indonesia in Australia as well, where the numbers considerably dropped uh, because of the bombing, of course, but also because of the government's um, kind of discourse um, around Asia in general, I would say. And um, fortunately, there's a bit of good news here, is that I think the Korean studies programs have been able to build around area studies in a sense. And so when I look around me, I see uh, very little culture, relatively speaking, so Japanese and Chinese, um, which I'm sure most of <laughs> most people are thinking of here, um, are relatively small in terms of culture and cultural activities, but Korean studies in general, and, and that's partly because of all the funding that we uh, receive, um, are much more prominent. So I guess it, it's both a sad and a good story. Uh, thank you very much. And adding on to what you just said and combining what we heard from Professor Lin and uh, Professor Bar, I would like to ask Professor Kim Sin Kyung this question. Uh, you only um, not only focus on Korean studies but gender studies as well. So within gender studies, What level of Korean cases do you refer to? You mentioned the issue of communication earlier. And also, there are uh, Korean studies side of your research, but one of the biggest um, challenges I see is that a scholar who handles Korean cases that can be widely accepted is hard to find, although we have a long history. For instance, in history, political science and social sciences, yes, um, there are Chinese studies and there are Japanese studies, but we don't really have a well-known and renowned scholar in this side. So what do you think? I don't think that's easy to answer. Um, so my career, the, all my career, I taught in the, the Department of Women's Studies and now mostly called Gender Studies. For 25 years, I was in Gender Studies. And after that, I came to Korean Studies per se into Indiana. So while I was working in Gender Studies, of course, my research was on Korea. And, but the kind of teaching I was able to do in gender studies, I was not able to teach in gender in Korea. Uh, 
the courses I was able to teach were related to women in East Asia, women's movement in East Asia as you know, overall kind of uh, issues, not Korea specific. So now I'm going to move out from gender studies to social science as a kind of a whole in the U.S. at least. So I wrote a paper in uh, Yoksa Bipyeong about how the status of social science in the U.S. and how it is problematic at this point when we talk about area studies. When we talk about area studies, we usually talk about, of course, history, literature, and anthropology oftentimes included. In the U.S., the turn of social science in the 1990s on, moving away from any kind of uh, country focus and mostly focusing on theory, modeling, and other ways of coming up with the scholarly you know, product and also in the discipline itself. As because of that, partly the ones that, and I'm talking here about the kind of a hires in the US at this point, we've been looking to hire social scientists in many different schools, trying to hire a social scientist who focuses on Korea. And many, many schools failed because they couldn't work with disciplines. So when the line is given to, let's say, sociology or political science, when they bring in candidates who are focusing on whose research is on Korea, and here comes to what you said earlier about why is it that those of us who study Korea, how come we couldn't produce someone like Clifford Geertz, who is who does, who is not a main, you know, the area person, but whose contribution to theoretical understanding, thick description, kind of things have been very, very influential. At this point, um, the way I see it is, we, uh, the people who are studying Korea and especially in uh, social science, we have to, we have to give um, some kind of a preference or even a focus to more of a comparative studies, rather than just Korea as one uh, country to focus on that because it's not gonna happen. So if it is not gonna happen, how can we have any kind of a field in the US in social science how do we then train our students? Then focusing on comparative way of analysis and having Korea as one part of very important comparative analysis focus. I think that way we can train the students and also train it in such a way if someone can do an excellent comparative analysis between Japan and Korea, Korea and China and what have you. What's wrong with that? You see. And can I say just one yeah. thing? I don't know how many of you have seen in 2019 at AAS, there was a round table discussion among Japanese scholars. That round table was provocatively titled as it, I wrote it down, the death of Japan studies. And that was, they discussed it because what has been happening in the humanities in the US and the way we know of Japan studies, talking about World War II, talking about Cold War and what have you, they essentially declared it has died. And after that, 2020 on, younger star scholars of Japanese studies are now coming back and saying we need to rebuild Japanese studies. So they are now calling it as the rebirth of Japanese <coughs> studies. And trying to do, a, again, more kind of a comparative ways and connecting with transnational ways. And that was another thing I would really would like to emphasize. Yeah, 그, 
Uh, yes, so recently area studies and Korea studies and I was writing a paper on that and I recall that at AAS uh, there are Korean related panels and I've looked into the trend and if you look at this, it's not only Korea but in East Asia and also uh, in the wider Asian society, there are more comparative views uh, and insights being shared. So I don't know what to, well, up to what extent, I'm not sure because I wasn't part of the discussions, but I think that that is an important topic. So Professor Dishino, I think that it also has to do with your comment. So within the discipline, there's a sub-discipline and if we, let's say, there are cases on Korea, but let's say that is there a way for such a sub-discipline to be powerful in Japan? I think that this is uh, one task or challenge of Korean studies. In other words, uh, you really need a lot of knowledge on the area, but also within that discipline, you also need the competencies and expertise. And as mentioned, you need to be able to compare the two and draw some generalizations or to really engage in that comparing contrast. So Professor Nishino, you did mention this a bit, but could you maybe uh, add to that, please? Yes, thank you. Well, I, I think I can say that um, fortunately, interest in Korea among Jap Japan is quite high. There is the Korean history issue, the North Korean issue, Hallyu and K novels nowadays. So there is a high level of interest in Korea. But nevertheless, did it really bring a big uh, positive change to the disciplinary area? Well, we do have a larger number of temporary lecturers and instructors in Korean studies, but that doesn't necessarily lead to a full-blown and regular program. To further evolve Korean studies, um, as has been mentioned by Professor Lin, well, in the political science arena, I must uh, conduct my research on Korean studies. And as Professor Lin has mentioned, uh, I need to have, be confident um, on my methodology. If not, Korean studies will not be able to find its place. And in relation to this, in the social sciences arena, we need to be able to speak English fluently. So the Korean studies scholars in Japan are facing challenges of having to speak Korean very fluently, and that is even not enough. We need to learn English and methodology of research. Uh, but um, that is an inevitable and essential process to go through. And to my students, um, I tell them to do that. Uh, they need to have a good understanding and knowledge of the Korean Peninsula, but uh, methodol methodology must also be developed for their specific area of specialty. Thank you. And before we came into this wrap-up session, in the previous session, we um, discussed the uh, K-culture and Hallyu, and we did have some disputes over that. So including all this, and um, if you have any comments or questions about anything today, um, please raise your hand. And if we have time remaining, we will call back to our panelists and hear from them. But now, if you have any questions or comments, the floor is open. President Lee, are you? Do you deserve? Or do you? Do you? Are they eligible to talk at all? Uh, so I tried to stay put, but I do have a question. It may be a practical question. Now, I'm not a, an expert uh, uh, in this field, but as I was listening to the discussions, I can see that 
uh, scholars in Korean studies are actually spread out, scattered across the world, engaging in various disciplines. So in terms of creating synergy or in terms of division of labor in Korean studies, I think that maybe that would be the weak point of the current um, Korean studies. Uh, so I guess whether it be Copenhagen School or Chicago School, I think that we do have like a school approach, uh, which uh, we can actually have these schools intensively go into a topic. That would be great. But I'm not sure whether that can work. It may seem a bit difficult. So my question is, you can see that uh, we do have a network uh, of Korean scholars divided up into regions, so North, North America, Europe, and so forth. So maybe we can have a network amongst uh, Korean uh, study scholars that focus on a particular topic. So for instance, in KU University, we may be able to have a network uh, centered on KU that focuses on uh, studies in North Korea and for, for those uh, in film, maybe Copenhagen. So maybe we can create a network based on research topics or issues so that we can go in depth and to also find a way to have these groups represent the key topics of Korean studies. So uh, for me, uh, I think as an investor of KF, I want, just wanted to understand whether this is a feasible plan. So yes, that was a very important comment. And I want to mention that I know Professor Yu Youngju is currently engaging in a certain education um, networking amongst those in the U.S. Midwestern states. We're not a research network. But I also know that Professor Kim is a key member, but we actually have a consortium called the Big Ten Alliance, and we share courses uh, and teachings. And President Lee mentioned about a topical network uh, uh, formed for scholars, and I think that's a novice approach. It seems uh, very interesting. but. It's a network that has to be established in an organic fashion, and it probably has to be a spontaneous, uh, spontaneous network among scholars. But if it's forced to be organized, would that be possible? I'm not exactly sure about that. I'm a bit skeptical. So if you look at uh, the historians of Korea and Japan, they do have a group. Um, so there is a group that looks into the changes of lifestyles uh, for the decades, but it's not um, very well known. But is there anything that you would like to add, Professor Ball? Uh, yes, this morning, Professor Lee Jung mentioned uh, that in Europe, there are different groups in place. So this at least will not be a problem. But in my view, the research group and the teacher group should be distinguished uh, re among researchers. I think that these groups have um, naturally sprung up, but um, I belong to the Northern European area and I am a literature major. And there are so many different types of Korean literature and I cannot cover all of them alone. So for the past few years, we have, we have uh, working with Oslo University with Professor in Park and in Helsinki and Stockholm, we have other professors. So we all come together for a week of Northern European Korean Studies seminar. And not because we are good scholars, but because we cannot cover the wide range of Korean literature on our own individually. There is a good history professor at uh, Helsinki and um, North Korean experts in in Stockholm. So if we all bring our own area of expertise, then we will be able to cover a much wider area than what we can each do on our own. So rather than forming research groups, I think forming teachers group or teaching group 
could be a good idea for Northern European. Isn't that the same situation in North America as well? It's about the same, but I, what I want to go back is, Professor Yu and I talked about briefly about, uh, I don't want to use this term, but I have the branding. Branding of but, uh, any schools, especially for graduate education. Because in the US at this point, graduate education is, uh, you know, wherever there's PhD education and masters, and we educate students in generally, and whoever comes in who works with individual uh, uh, teacher and then others to come up with their research project and do go on. So what we were talking about was, it will come to a point that we may not be able to do that anymore because we may have to, each school may have to develop our own expertise, meaning the, having the faculty members to be able to say that we are doing, let's say we were talking about post-war studies. So our school is going to train from here on the graduate students who will become experts on X, Y, Z. And that again, I know it has to happen organically, but at the same time, I think it is a possibility if we have our mind to it and to have resources together and cluster-wise to make that happen. So teaching and a, uh, research. Well, I think that we can raise the level of research uh, in Korean studies, among the scholars, we have different disciplinary groups. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I think, World History Association Congress uh, was held, and I gave a presentation before the German scholars, but I felt very out of place. Because in the way we are trained in history here in Korea was quite different from those of other countries, and I think that the gap still exists. So when you look at the issues of teaching and research, they don't always are conjoined, but the demand of students uh, to learn have reached the Korean studies level, but raising the level of academics in this particular field are, are mismatched with the demand of students. So of course, those are the challenges posed to area studies in general. But anyone on in the floor who would like to comment? Yes, back there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I was listening to the discussions, and my take on that was that there are many topics, but I think particularly uh, we've been talking about Hallyu uh, and whether Hallyu in Korean studies and area studies be harmonized. So we've uh, listened to many views. And of course, there were also some concerns raised in the process. But basically what I want to say is that if we do present on Hallyu, you may think that we are Hallyu experts or Hallyu scholars. But uh, in my years at the graduate school and in my 20 years in the academia, I've never actually met a Hallyu scholar. There, This is uh, not something that's uh, tangible as of yet, because in the respective academic disciplines in media, uh, they focus on K-pop, uh, that's how it branches out, and that is indicated as a Korean wave phenomenon, but it's not actually put together as an academic discipline. So if we say that a uh, highly researchers or highly scholars of maybe thinking that uh, they are well, moving into these different territories, I think, really does not make sense. And then you also talked about the uh, Korean wave quality, but uh, it seems as if the study on Hallyu uh, actually lacks uh, the quality or that it's not as noble and it, uh, it was quite uneasy to hear. Many of the Korean, the, many of the researchers that could research uh, or study Korean wave in terms of methodology or research design, it hasn't been 
clear cut because Korean Wave, as mentioned, uh, has not been put together as an academic discipline, and that area in itself has not been well defined. So it's in the process of getting defined. So I think that we really need to have the process in place. And the last point I would like to make is the following. Area studies and Korean studies. Uh, of course, we do need uh, kaigyu, and the reason why is because of the students. There's a need uh, and the demand from the students, and we need to cater to the demand, and that's why we need to put together the classes and find the right researchers to teach. And this is something that uh, we can resist or refuse. So whether it be an expert in area studies or for or whether it be those in media studies, uh, those that can actually meet the demand of the students can teach. And I think the fact that we have such resources is a good thing. So at the end of the day, Hallyu, I think it's not about overstepping uh, into other territories or their domains. It's not a, an issue of conflict, but it can be a gateway for Korean uh, studies and all of the academic dif disciplines can come together and find a way to utilize uh, Hallyu. And in that aspect, KF and the Academic Academy of Korean Studies, the financing that's offered by these institutions, I think, uh, can be shared by these various disciplines. So yes, please do not misunderstand, misunderstand me, though that was not my intention at all. Mm, Professor Hong Seok Young and all of those uh, comments, I do agree. And I want to mention that Seoul National University uh, it's true that we haven't been able to cater to the needs, uh, the, to the demands overseas, and uh, I mentioned that we may need scholars that need to cater to the needs. So, uh, well, I mean, I don't think that we have a lot of time. So, maybe yeah, I can give you maybe thirty seconds. Uh, I think I really have to conclude. So, within thirty seconds, please. <laughs> Thirty seconds starts now. Okay. So we are speaking about Korean studies and Korean studies research, and you have all given great comments. But just one thing, I think we have been forgetting that the needs of Korean studies seen from Korea and seen from the different countries such as Germany or France are different how to include Korean studies in the particular country is what we're missing. Hallyu is very important, yes, and students want to learn about Hallyu, but for Korean studies to have a certain status in different countries, there are certain topics that we must address in Korean studies, so we need to think about that altogether. Thank you very much. And I have been pressed to conclude this session. I was unable to give our panelists more time and very sorry. And um, just to take the floor for 30 seconds, yes, Korea Foundation has played a huge role for the development of Korean studies to reach its current level. Yes, we have AKS, we have the King Sejong Institute. We should think about how to address the needs of overseas con in other countries, as mentioned by Professor Lee just now. And I hope that we can resolve all the challenges that have been mentioned today. And I trust that President Lee will do just that. And I would like to ask everyone in this room to do your part as well. Thank you for joining us. And that concludes this session. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Park uh, Kim uh, and our speakers, panelists. Thank you very much for their insightful comments. Once again, a big round of applause for our panelists for session four. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the 2022 KF Global Korean Studies Forum um, did you all enjoy this forum? I believe that it was packed with insightful comments and presentations. And I can see that the passion and the energy of all of our scholars had filled the venue uh, and the event. And as soon as we rearrange the stage, we will commence the closing ceremony. Uh, we would like to invite Executive Vice President Jungkook Lee of the Korea Foundation for his closing remarks. Please welcome him with a big hand.
제가 오늘 다른 여기 이 자리에 참석하실 많은 분들 i d s off in between, but I did have a uh, Uh, I had a meaningful time with uh, all of the discussions. So as a supporter of these endeavors, uh, uh, we were able to get some good tips and advice on how KF can be an even better supporter of your efforts. And in addition to that, I want to mention that all of our educators Uh, and scholars uh, going through their recollection, their self-confession in Korean studies was also something that I was able to uh, listen to. So they were all quite interesting. And I just wanted to mention my personal take on today's event. I believe that today's uh, KF uh, Global Korean Studies Forum held in commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the foundation and under the theme Paradigm Changes and Future Development of Korean Studies was a meaningful venue to look back on the past and present and forward uh, to the future of Korean studies. And I would like to um, express my deep appreciation to all participants both from home and abroad for their contributions during the discussions. In today's forum, we were able to better our understanding on the current situation by region, including the North America uh, and European region, where regions where research and education in Korean studies is quite detailed and specified, as well as Asia, Latin America, and Central Asia and Africa, uh, where Korean studies is rapidly spreading, centered on learning the Korean language and understanding Korean culture. And I believe that this very fact is a concrete achievement of this forum. Furthermore, with the development of ICT technology, the internet, and the influence of the pandemic, uh, e-learning is being established as an important method in Korean language and Korean studies education. And uh, we have confirmed the contributions made by the KF e-learning program. We were able to reconfirm that the fact that approximately 1,500 universities around the world teach the Korean language as part of their curriculum represents the rapid growth of Korean studies and the overall growth in uh, national power of Korea and the particular geographic, geographical situation of Korea, the economic growth of Korea, and the cultural interest and attractiveness represented by uh, Hallyu Act in the background. Uh, this dissemination of Korean studies and Korean language contrasts with the recent trend of uh, a crisis of the humanities in which interest in the humanities is weakening worldwide. Uh, and when it comes to Hallyu, we've been exchanging and we did exchange many views and opinions at today's event. So I believe that it's important to provide the right amicable environment for the growth of Korean studies and Korean language. But I also believe that going forward, it could be a key research topic that we can uh, delve into further. Uh, so that was something that we were able to confirm as well, uh, that it can be a key research topic, the Hallyu phenomenon itself. And meanwhile, it was pointed out that along with the quantitative expansion of Korean studies, there is still much room for improvement in the qualitative aspects of Korean studies. In order to improve the situation, efforts from all participants in the Korean studies ecosystem are required, and the Korea Foundation will actively support this endeavor. Although there was a lack of sufficient discussions due to time constraints, the Korea Foundation will continue uh, to communicate and interact closely with various experts in the field of Korean studies and actively cooperate as a partner in unfolding the blueprint for the future of Korean studies. And when the time comes uh, to assess and evaluate the development and progress of Korean studies in the next 20 or 30 years, uh, we expect to witness a quantum leap in 
um, Korean studies altogether. Once again, I would like to express my gratitude to all expert scholars from home and abroad for their participation in this forum. And with this, let me bring my closing address to an end. Thank you. 네, 이종국 Thank you very much, Executive Vice President Lee jong for your closing remarks. Now we have come to the end of the forum. I would like to thank all speakers for your wonderful presentations and discussions and all participants who joined us online and on site. I look forward to your, and I ask you for your support um, for Korean studies. I am Yoon Chang-sik from KF. Thank you. Thank you.